Thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Get 26% off and a free Nebula account by following the link in the description. So the other day, I was just minding my own business. You know, doing my own thing. And then, as it happens for a lot of people, I was struck with the inspiration to make a granular synthesis tutorial. I started off by looking at other videos on YouTube to see, you know, whether it was worth making one and what was already available. At first, it was pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, I think the first title I saw was called White Dude Explains Arturia Pigments, and that one was pretty good. Um, I watched another one after that called White Dude Explains Omnisphere Granular, and I was really starting to get the point. But then things started to get confusing. I watched this video on time stretching samples in Ableton, and then I watched this other one on taking like little chunks of sine waves and putting them together to make a new sound. And then I watched these other ones on these programs called Spear and Sound Magic Spectral. At this point, I was kind of like, are these people confused about what granular synthesis is or am I? If all of these different things count as granular synthesis, then what even is it? Lucky for me, I was able to get in touch with arguably the number one daddy of granular synthesis. Barry Truax. He invented the first real-time granular synthesizer back in the 80s. I'm very sympathetic to how you're going to solve this problem of how to deal with this because yeah. it's so fundamentally different from the, you know, th the other you know, videos you've done. After talking to Barry, I realized that if all of these different things, like time stretching and little chunks of sine waves, do count as granular synthesis, then I'd need to be able to come up with a definition that fits all of them. So I decided to go through all the different examples and see what they have in common. Maybe then I'll be able to say what granular synthesis actually is. So let's say you're watching a granular synthesis tutorial on YouTube. And instead of just getting to the fucking point already, the presenter is taking this long recipe blog-like journey on the way to her conclusion. The story of granular synthesis is one about childhood, family, and reconnecting with my roots. One thing that you could do would be to increase the playback speed. Now, if you're a boomer like me, you'll remember that if you increase the playback speed of a vinyl record or a cassette deck, the pitch will increase with it. But if you increase the playback speed of a YouTube video, it doesn't do that. So how does that work? So how does that work? How does it work? How does it work? Ugh. So one thing you can do is to break the sound down into overlapping chunks and then refit those chunks back together at the desired playback speed. So if I make a sound like, ah, uh, I can cut it into chunks and refit them back together to make it shorter uh. or to make it longer. Uh. So clearly my janky homemade example has some distracting audio artifacts, but the algorithms in Ableton Live work on the same principle. Uh... What's really cool about time stretching in Ableton Live is that you can choose between different algorithms that try to preserve different musical qualities. So if you want to keep your pitch sounding really nice and clean, you can choose the tones algorithm. Uh... And if you want the internal rhythm to be maintained better, you can choose the beat setting. Uh... And of course, you can still pitch your sample up and down regardless of how much it's stretched. So time stretching involves breaking, breaking your fucking brain, breaking your soul, breaking your will to live. You have no more will to live when you do time stretching. It's really sad, so don't do it. <laughs> breaking a sound down into a bunch of little chunks and then refitting those chunks back together to change the length of the sound independent of its pitch. Then I started to learn about these programs that break sound down into frequencies or partials and allow you to break those partials down into chunks and rearrange them all to do some absolutely crazy shit. One example of these programs is called Spear and honestly, I'm surprised it isn't extremely popular. <laughs> Then I learned about this suite of plugins called Sound Magic Spectral by Michael Norris. There's like 137 different plugins. I mean, not really, but there's a lot. Um, and some of them are much more usable than others, in my opinion, but they have simpler, higher level controls than a program like Spear. This one's called Spectral Pulsing. And this one's called Spectral Averaging. I had never thought of programs like this as granular before. 
But I guess like time stretching, they allow you to break sound down into chunks and then rearrange those chunks to make a new sound. So is that what makes something granular? What about the kind of synth that Barry Truax made in the 80s? How does that fit into our definition? So if I change the frequency range to 50 hertz, or 100, or 200, or 500, we start getting some very rich textures, even though these are just sine waves. The instrument that he created is called the GSX. It produces a bunch of tiny little chunks of sound, usually from sine waves, called grains. So we have this slowly emerging sidebands that start taking over the, um, the pattern that's just started again. So it's like this approaching wave of temporal variation. You can set the rate that the GSX reads through the grains with frequency, and you can set the duration of the grains. The GSX produces so many different grains that it doesn't really make sense to try to control them individually. So you can also set a range of frequencies and durations and the computer will randomly select one for each grain. What you hear is more of a texture or a distribution of grains within the ranges that you set. I asked Barry what led up to him creating the instrument. It was a, an amazing transitional moment. In around 1983, 84, 85, I was using this microprocessor called the DMX1000. And it was very, it was very simple. It only had 4K of memory. Memory was very expensive at that point. But the speed was there to go at audio rates. But the I had to create my own software. It did seem like breaking into a completely new auditory domain. Yeah. It was just like it was just stunning. He explained to me that in the time leading up to making the GSX, he was looking to get control over smaller and smaller chunks of time in his compositions. But what had led up to it was actually through the FM synthesis okay. that I had been doing for 10 years. In terms of timbre design, I yeah. was increasingly working at smaller and smaller subunits. The, the key development was trying to get more and more control over micro level timbre and eventually it led me to the microsound domain without even me realizing it. In fact, it was a very natural transition to one day wake up and do full-blown granular synthesis. Okay, what does this word microsound mean? Hmm, if you want to see cool shots of me googling the book and then buying it and then it showing up on my doorstep and me continuing the video with the book in my hand, consider signing up to my Patreon. Let's see, it looks like Wikipedia has some quotes from the book. Microsound includes all sounds on the time scale shorter than musical notes and longer than the sample. Specifically, this is shorter than 100 milliseconds and longer than 10 milliseconds. Okay, so sounds shorter than 100 milliseconds uh, and longer than 10 milliseconds. Uh, okay, this is starting to make sense. I think it all comes down to the chunk. <laughs> Time stretching is about breaking sound down into tiny little chunks and rearranging them. And so are programs like Sound Magic Spectral and Spear, except they allow you to break the sound down into partials and chunks. The GSX synthesizes sounds rather than deconstructing them or processing them, but nonetheless, it creates new sounds using a bunch of little sound chunks. So does that definition hold up to the instruments that I originally thought were granular, like Arteria Pigments and Omnisphere Granular? Yes! Absolutely. In fact, they work a lot like the GSX, except for rather than using sine waves, they allow you to drop in your own sample for them to granulate. You can still set the speed that it reads through the grains. How many grains there are. And what part of the sample it reads the grains from. So I guess granular synthesis or granulation or microsound is really more of a broad way of thinking about sound or constructing and deconstructing it rather than being a specific method of synthesis. That's pretty interesting, right? Because with the main methods of synthesis like subtractive or FM synthesis, it's really all about the spectrum. 
Like with subtractive synthesis, the idea is that you take a complex sound and you subtract partials from it to make it more musical. Or with FM synthesis, you take two really simple sounds like sine waves and you modulate the frequency of one with the other to make a more complex spectrum. Right, because the idea with spectrum is that you can take a sound and break it down into a bunch of different waves or partials that make it up. And the frequency and intensity of those partials is what makes the spectrum of the sound. But with microsound, it's like, that's cute spectrum, but I am all about breaking sound down into little chunks. And if you think about like sounds in nature, this is actually really intuitive. Like think about the wonderful crunchy sound of walking on a gravel road. What is actually happening there? Well, you're hearing the cumulative effect of all of these tiny little pieces of gravel being like crunched into the ground as you walk over them. You're not hearing the individual sound events, but rather the texture or distribution of them all together. The same could be said about the sound of waves crashing against the shore, or grains being poured into a bowl, or a swarm of insects. My favorite. I think that for any sound that is more textural than pitch based, it probably makes a lot more sense to think of it as being made up of points rather than waves. And this could be a jumping off point for all kinds of new interesting ways of thinking about sound and music. It could be making your own instrument or sound processing techniques if you're very nerdy, or it could be using making sound design for films or animations or basically any music that prioritizes timbre over pitch. And she loves the drama, and she loves the feud, but Spectrum and Microsound are not really in competition with one another whatsoever. Spectrum is still an extremely useful way of thinking about sound, especially with subtractive synthesis, and basically anything pitch base and a bunch of other contexts. Really, the point of this video is that Microsound is a totally valid, so valid, like so valid other way of thinking about sound. And all the sound processing and synthesis methods that involve granulation or granular synthesis or microsound or whatever are really quite fun. Thanks for watching and I will see y'all very soon. Check Haroni, check it out. Wait, what do you need to check for? You can find out by watching the extended ad-free version of this video with an entire blooper reel on Nebula. I've just joined an amazing team of creators there, including Adam Neely, Lindsay Ellis, and Wendover Productions. On Nebula, we don't have to worry about keeping our videos a certain length or getting demonetized for our questionable blooper reel content. It's all about the videos themselves. Plus, we regularly upload companion videos and bonus content. If you want to see the full interview I did with Barry Truax for this video, you can watch it on Nebula. But the best part of the deal is that you can get Nebula for free when you sign up to CuriosityStream. For a limited time, you get 26% off your annual subscription when you sign up using my code with the link in the description. That's less than 15 bucks a year for both Nebula and CuriosityStream. At CuriosityStream, you will get access to literally thousands of nonfiction and documentary films. Lately, I've been watching the show Dream of the Future, and they have this epic episode about robots that play music and new human digital music interfaces. So click on the link in the description and get Nebula and CuriosityStream for less than 15 bucks a year. It's a great way to help out my channel and get access to that sweet, sweet content that you love.